Hello, I'm Olana Palko and I'm delighted to welcome you to Eastern Europe's Minorities in a Century of Change, a podcast on the history of minority experiences in Central and Eastern Europe during the 20th century. This series is part of the Institute of Historical Research Centennial Commemorations Our Century, Looking Back, Thinking Forward, and has been organized by the Basis Study Group for Minority History. It was made possible through the help and support of the British Association of Slavonic and East European Studies. The study group is a forum devoted to researching minorities in the national and regional histories of Central, Eastern and South East Europe and promoting closer scholarly collaborations. For more information, please visit our website at studygroupforminorityhistory.com. On this episode, Boris Kutsmani at the University of Vienna talks to us about the concept of non-territorial autonomy and its role in minority protection. Boris, welcome to the podcast. Can you start by telling us a little, a little about yourself and how you became interested in Slavistics and East European history? Uh, thank you for, uh, for reaching out to me. Um, how did I become interested in in, uh, in in the wider field of Central and Eastern European history? I, I think it's because I was when I was 12 years old, it was it was the Iron Curtain that fell, and uh, I realized that something was going on in this world, and um, I wanted to know more, or at least I wanted to understand what was happening. You know, Vienna was uh, for decades locked right next to the Iron Curtain and then out of a sudden it came, came, became part of this, of this region again, of a, of a larger region and I was fascinated with this. And then a little bit later I fell into love with Russian literature, I have to admit. And, um, and the third reason might be that I, I think I always had an interest uh, in in regions or people or topic that are slightly off topic so that are ex- exceptional or I mean Central and Eastern Europe is not exceptional but it's something that is not so strongly in the focus of many people's minds and I think this is how it all started. So have you always worked at the University of Vienna or what was your academic journey? Oh no! Well, I started my academic journey at the University of Vienna, and I, I moved back and forth many times, and eventually I, I ended up here again. But um, during my undergrads, I, I, yeah, I did all that what uh, European students at that time did. So I had an Erasmus in Paris, in Paris, and then I did my alternative civil service in Moscow uh, for a year. And then when I, so after I graduated from, from the university, um, I started a PhD, um, which was a co a, a joint doctorate between the University of Vienna and the University of Paris Sorbonne. And uh, the, the, the choice of Paris was not, uh, not necessarily because my sources were there, but there was a very good researcher with whom I wanted to work. And... Um, because I was trained as a historian and a Slavicist, and she was a literary, literary scholar in, in German and Yiddish studies, and this, this somehow was very inspiring. And then for my research, I lived half a year in Ukraine, and I learned Polish because it was necessary. I was working on a, a Galician border town within the Habsburg Empire. And, yeah, and after... after after I, after my PhD, I spent a year um, at Central European University when it was still in Budapest, uh, and yeah, then I spent a couple of years at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and then I I, I was lucky enough to to receive this ERC grant, and this brought me then back to the University of Vienna. So it's a it's a long circle, and. Um, but in the end, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me uh, let me go back to your PhD and uh, the, the, your award-winning book uh, that was based on your PhD, Brode, a Galician border city in the long 19th century. 
Until recently, most studies of empires, including those of the Soviet Union, focused primarily on examining central policies and the way they were translated and implemented in the peripheries. In your book, however, you reverse this conventional perspective. What can such a nuanced study of the periphery tell us about the center? And more generally, uh, why did you decide to focus your research on this border town? And what made Broda distinctive from other Galician and Austria-Hungarian Austria towns of the time? Okay, these were several questions, so <laughs> I start with what we can learn. I think we can learn everything. Um, actually, I think, or studying empires in general from, from the fringes is more interesting than studying it from, from the center, because uh, most people did not live in the center, but in the peripheries. And um, it's also a very centralist perspective that there is a center and the periphery uh, because peripheries um, are very different and uh, with the study on Brody I, I realized that there that uh, which what is obvious if you think about it that there were multiple centers uh, and multiple peripheries and um, I think this was so I think we can learn very very much of you if we study um, this and uh, of course the Habsburg Empire is very, you are right, the, the, in particular the Habsburg, but also the Russian Empire is very often studied from the, from, from, from the center, um, in particular if you study and live in Vienna, um, because you have the sources here, and, and the, the central perspective is also interesting, but it's just one perspective. And, um, and the problem with empires, if you do not go for the central uh, view or the central archives, you need to know much many more languages than German or German Hungarian in, 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 in the Habsburg Empire or Russian in the Russian Empire. And this is of course very demanding. And um, because if you want to keep up this uh, multi perspective um, approach. And your second question was how, Hi, how why Brody? Um, so here comes the, the Austrian part in my personal history. You know, uh, there is a quite famous uh, Austrian um, writer, uh, Josef Roth, who was born in Brody. And this is a person you read, most Austrians read some when in either in school or, or, or later in the lifetime. And uh, Josef Roth is, is tackling Brody from a literary perspective. And... Uh, but he's doing his thing with his hometown. He's peripherizing it and, and mythologizing it. And, um, and I was on a... We had an academic uh, trip to... When I was still another undergraduate to... We had a, a tour, an academic field trip to Galicia. And we also passed uh, Broly. And it, this was in, eight, in 1999. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Brody was a very provincial town in, in post-Soviet Ukraine. And, uh, but you, you saw so many remnants and it, it looked very interesting. Uh, so this was a, my first contact with Brody. Then I turned away. I was studying uh, Soviet Jewish nationality politics for, for my master's degree. But then after having lived a year in, in Russia, I was somehow... I wanted to do something else, and I, I also uh, wanted to move more westwards with my research space. And then my, my then uh, supervisor, Andreas Kapela, uh, he proposed, why not do Brody, that's such an interesting city. And then I got in touch. I, I, at that point, I still knew only from this field trip and from literature. And very soon... I understood that Brody was something very particular in, in history, not only in Austrian uh, or Habsburg history, but also in economic history, because Brody was, I think it is fair to say that in, in the late 18th and early 19th century, Brody was the most important trading town in Central and Eastern Europe. It was a hub, it was a, a trading hub with, uh, that reached out to to Leipzig and even contacts were going 
up until Lyon in France and to the east to Berdichev and then later Odessa, of course. So, and, and uh, Brody was kind of the, the hub that, uh, where, the, where the large sale traders resided and they traveled back and forth and they, in, in Brody they unpacked. And, and, uh, so this was, uh, uh, from economic history point of view, uh, it was very interesting. Then also from the Habsburg history uh, side, it was very interesting because um, the, the Austrian bureaucrats very quickly understood the importance of, of Brody in, in, in the trade business and um, Brody was granted a, a free trade privilege in, oh no, 1789, I think? No, 1779. Um, which it retained for a, for a century. And uh, so the Austrian uh, administration understood very well that uh, in order not to lose this, this commercial hub, it was necessary to treat it, uh, give it special treatment. And it was, at that time, there were three havens in Trieste and in Rijeka, Fiume. And uh, the free trade privilege of Brody was actually designed after these uh, maritime free havens, although Brody is a very, very landlocked place. And on the long run, this landlocked uh, geographical situation uh, was bad for the city because uh, trading relations between the Habsburg and the Russian Empire went worse and worse. And uh, so you can only be a free haven if both sides of cooperate, uh, cooperate and, and, and let the goods pass. Um, and Austria as well as Russia pursued a, a very... Uh, isolist uh, or uh, high high um, customs policy. So this is why economically in the second half of the 19th century Brody was not such an economic success. Um, which is interesting because 19th century is normally the time when everything is growing and improving. But Brody not. Brody was one of the 20 largest cities in the Imperial Austria in 1830 but in 1910, it was a one-horse town in Galicia somewhere. And the other thing why it is so interesting, um, uh, so this is why Brody is interesting as a borderland, and the second thing is Brody was such an important Jewish city. It was the Habsburg Empire's, I think it's fair to say, the, the, the largest Jewish city, um, with two-thirds, three-quarters of the population being Jewish. And... It was also for Jewish intellectual history a very, very important place because it was one of the, <coughs> the few places where the, the Jewish um, enlightenment, the Haskalah, could take roots, whereas in the rest of the region, the um, uh, Hasidism flourished. And this also gave Brody a special position in Jewish history. And I was also trying to research this. This was also something that is different from Brody, from that differs Brody from other um, Galician or Habsburg cities. Um, yeah. So you mentioned already that Boda was a very important Jewish center. Uh, so, but and, and that was kind of predominantly a Jewish city. So how such national and confessional composition uh, challenge our uh, understanding of minority versus majority dynamic? Uh, how were the rights of the Jewish community guaranteed there? And were they actually considered to be a minority? And what were their relations with the Christian uh, population in mm -hmm. the town? I mean, on the one hand, having Jewish majorities in cities is something very common for Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, this all over the... the I mean, the, the, the urban network was so little for centuries in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so the, the, the cities were, towns were Jewish. And uh, so this, in this way, uh, Brody is not so exceptional. It was just slightly more than the norm, than, than the ordinary percentage. <coughs> um, but what is really, uh, and I have not found this for any other place in the Habsburg Empire, uh, was the political integration of the Jewish elites in, in the urban society. So it, it was a, in, in, even in the administration, um, um, 
even by the end of the 18th century, so very early, um, the, the Jewish elites has a equal have an equal number in the in the city council, and um, and what is more interesting when then at some point the, the, the Galician administration found out that uh, the Jewish share in the city administration was so high that they somehow contested it. And then you, I found letters where the, 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 the Christian elite said, no, we have to keep them because at first it would be unfair. Uh, and second, because uh, we don't have enough other qualified people to do so. Um, but of course this is an elite thing. So the... Um, and also, when I, as I just said before, it's, uh, it was a Haskalah city, but it was only, of course, the elites that were uh, adherents of, uh, of enlightened uh, Jewry. The, the poor classes, they, 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 all, they were Hasidic. And they, of course, were not integrated into, into, into the municipal structures, but Christian lower classes weren't either. And... Um, very early, you can find um, you can find uh, uh, deputy mayors, Jewish deputy mayors, um, already after 1848, when this uh, was still not de facto not possible in any other parts of, of Austria, and then you had later, of course, you had uh, Jewish mayors. Um, so this is really very unusual. And what about popular antisemitism? How widespread it was. In the context of Brode, um, because obviously this is the time, like the late nineteenth century, we have this is the time of the pogroms and so on. I have not found a single incident of of of, of violent anti-Semitism in 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 Brody. Uh, but it would be very difficult. I mean, if three quarters of the city are Jewish, I mean, who who, who should bash home? Um, so. Uh, I have not seen it. Where you can detect it uh, a little bit uh, is in the in the end of the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Um, I have not mentioned before that the, the Brody Jewish elites, uh, as they were so close to the Haskalah, the, the Enlightenment movement, and the Haskalah movement was so close to German thinkers, the elites were German spoken. And uh, with the nationalizing projects um, of Poles and Ukrainians, you sometimes find complaints uh, that uh, why do um, German crafts still use uh, uh, Jewish crafts still use German signboards in the city? So it's about the urban space. Um, but I also have to admit it's difficult to judge because Brody, in the end of the nineteenth century was not a prosperous place, and there was, for instance, no local, local newspaper. There was only for three years a local newspaper that ran in, in the late 19th century, for three years, which was a Polish newspaper from a Polish patriot. Um, but it was not directed uh, against Jews. Um, but you mentioned the pogroms. The pogroms were... Uh, Brody was very affected by the pogroms, in particular in 1880, 1881, um, because Brody was the first first port for Jewish refugees, and uh, this is actually very interesting. Uh, uh, I wrote my thesis, be, so I published a book in in, 19, in 2011, and when then the the, uh, the huge uh, refugee crisis in Europe in in 2016 occurred. I saw so many um, mechani me mechanisms that were similar uh, in 2016 to, 2000, uh, to 1881. So, for instance, this idea, um, efforts to control or get regain control over the borders so that the, 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 that the authorities knew who is coming, who is not coming. Um, to concentrate people in, in certain cities, um, also in order to control them, and also in order to facilitate um, uh, NGOs to help them. And Brody was basically... So if, if, 
if refugees were coming across the border, they were escorted to Brody uh, in order to, yeah, to, to control them. And the Alliance Israelite Universelle that tried to handle the crisis, they, had, they took their office in Brody. Because they knew that there is a, first there is a Jewish expertise most there. Refugees. Yeah, and most refugees are there. So it was this, this place. But of the refugees, almost nobody stayed in Brody. It was the, 18, the 1880s was, were economically the worst time for Brody. Um, so two thirds returned and one third moved further west. Um, now I would like to turn to discussing the premises of your current research project, um, uh, which is called Non-Territorial Autonomy as Minority Protection in Europe, an Intellectual and Political History of a Traveling Idea, 1850-2000. Minority protection became a burning issue in the aftermath of the First World War, when a major shift from the world of empires to the world of nations occurred. The Minority Treaty with Poland, signed in June 1919, was the first international agreement to provide for the protection of the minority rights in the new Europe. Nonetheless, as you convincingly show in your project, the concept of non-territorial autonomy as a method of, for managing ethnic diversity was most comprehensively articulated in the works of the Austrian Social Democrat Karol Renner, already in the turn of the 20th century. Uh, could you briefly explain what the historical and political context in the former Austria-Hungary was in which those ideas were first uh, developed? And why was it there and then that such an original idea for minority protection came to fruition? I think this is a very pertinent question and it is very much linked to, to discussions that were going on in the Habsburg Empire since, eight, since the revolution of 1848. Um, I think, so long before Renner and Bauer started their thinking, I think uh, most uh, legal theorists and political thinkers agreed that when it comes to national affairs, majority vote does not work. So, because you would, in national things, you could, a majority could always outvote a minority, and this might be democratic on the paper, but it will not resolve um, national tensions. And why this discussion was, because Austria basically, at least the Austrian part of the empire, acknowledged after 1848 it acknowledged to be a multinational state. Um, however, to organize it, but it acknowledged that it was a multinational state with multiple languages. And, and there was a lively, decades-long discussion. So how can we rebuild this state in order to make it nationally just? Um, and also very early, people understood that this is what they called then the territorial principle. So drawing new lines or changing the, the borders of the, of the crown and so the historical entities of the state um, would, not, uh, would not be enough or is not satisfying because uh, people lived uh, intermingledly uh, with each other. And so the, I think the biggest understanding was that the territorial principle doesn't work, but you would have to switch to the what they call the personal principle. So, um, and then you had heated debates, and you know heated debates um, uh, are good for creative thinking. They, are, they might not be good for, um, for smooth development, but for creative thinking they are very good. And uh, uh, Rena and the austro marxists actually Rena was not the first one. The first one was a Slovenian social democrat, Edwin Christen, who was uh, ventilating this idea to organize the state not according to territories but according to groups. Non-territorial autonomy is a group rights approach with all its problematics. Um, and uh, so what, what, did, what was Renner's main idea? main idea was to separate the competences of the state 
from the competences of the ethnic nation. So in here. at that time, people would always, or like in German or in the Slavonic languages, you would apply the term nation, nation in the sense of the ethnic community, not in the sense of the state. Um, so just not to confuse these terms when I speak of separation of the nation from the state, it's um, separating ethnicity from, uh, from citizenship. Yeah? So, um, and he said that each, um, so the state should have its competences in state businesses like uh, constructing roads, foreign policy, um, whereas everything that is cultural should be left to the ethnic community um, with its own structures. But what Rena, and this is uh, very often overlooked, Rena did not want to isolate these two things. But he wanted to, he, in his proposal, he, he, he drafted a system where the nation, the self-governed nation, would be part of the state structures as well. But each sphere with its own competences. And this is maybe the big difference to thinkers of non-territorial autonomy in the Russian Empire, who rather perceive the state uh, organizations and the, the ethno-national structures as something different and separated and that go besides each other, whereas the Austro-Marxists try to combine them in just uh, separate the spheres of competences. And the other thing I think what is um, mostly overlooked is that in Imperial Austria, in some provinces, there were non in the late so in the early 20th century, uh, new provincial constitutions were drafted, uh, national compromises between the groups that were living there, and uh, in four prov provinces we find non-territorial arrangements. Um, it was of course not in 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 the social in the Austro-Marxist sense. These were these compromises were created by by national politicians and, and imperial bureaucrats. Um, but you can find non-territorial arrangements introduced into practice. And in our project, we are very much interested in non-territorial autonomy as, a, as an idea, as a political idea, but also as an applied policy. So the, we, want, we try to bring these things together. Because very often they are studied separately. Uh, you touched upon this already, uh, but could you perhaps uh, outline uh, some basic principles of non-territorial autonomy and how does it differ from other forms of minority protection? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, if, you, if you will, you can make an analogy maybe to the competences of religious communities and the competences of states. And this is actually also uh, in his foreword, Rena refers to, to the religious wars of the, of the early modern period. And he said only at that point when the state got separated from the religion and not that the, the, the king or the prince of a, of a territory could determine the, the religion of its subject, only when this, this tight uh, correlation between prince and territory and its population was split, then the wars ended, the religious wars. So that's the analogy he makes. And he now says that the same thing we have to do with the, with the ethnic groups. So we have to give uh, each group, so each, each domain its sphere without the interference of the other side. Um, and, yeah, and, and to demarcate the, the competences. And what, so in the, in the it is a very complicated um, idea, because we're so used that, that people live in territories and uh, are administered by one administration. But, 
Renda's idea was he basically gave every citizen two souls a political soul and an ethno national soul. And when it comes to election, people would elect a central parliament according to their political soul, and they would elect um, ethno national representatives with their national soul. And, um, and at a certain level of government, these two souls would then meet again and uh, correspond, that, correspond and listen to each other. And um, Karl Renner was, and this is um, slightly unorthodox for Marxism, he was, he was a centralist in the sense that he thought that big entities are good, but he considered that the most important thing of administration would be the district. And um, because the, the districts of the, 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 the the town or the urban council, the city council, but then mainly the district as, as also as an economic entity that would work best. So, um, and much of the decision making should happen on this district level. And there again, you would have a political district level with its own council and you would have national councils on the district level, two or three, depending on how, how mixed the population would be in this uh, in this district. So he was he was looking for on the district level he was looking for a consociationalist approach so that where they should work together and on, on the general state level he wanted to provide autonomy but contact. So don't isolate but have them in contact. So what were the competencies then of this national culture uh, councils? Education? Uh... Mostly education, so schools, um, and everything that was considered the national sphere. Um, so, for instance, theatres, museums, national clubs. Um, but no, for instance, in, in the Austro Marxist thinking, not social issues. Social issues would be general state competences. And uh, I said that everybody would have two souls. Uh, and what does it mean, everybody has two souls? Um, because not, we are one person. So how to determine um, who goes into which group? Uh, so for the, for, the, for the political institution, it's clear. Every citizen would, would elect. Uh, but for the ethno-national councils, every... In, in mixed districts, every citizen would have to register in a national register. They called it catasters. Um, and according to this uh, national register, then they would be entitled to vote. But then, then, then a like, question. Um, wasn't this, this the same period of this kind of widespread uh, national indifference when people were like, you know, ambiguous about their identity and not necessarily knowing, you know, who they were, like yeah. in, in ethnic terms. So who would decide, who would help people, you know, classify yeah. themselves? Um, I mean, we are talking about the early 20th century and... Um, I actually prefer the term national ambivalence because I don't think that people were so entirely indifferent because they would they, because it would if if you said indifference then it would mean that that they did not know what they do what they did when they voted for national or nationalist parties and I think they knew um, but they played with it also in the censuses they they knew, I think they knew very well when they when they indicated. Czech or German or Slovene or German, uh, that this could mean more German schools or more Slovenian schools. The so implications I, of yeah. So I think it's I think uh, we don't learn necessarily how they identified personally, but I think they were aware that something was going on. Um, and in this idea with the registers, with the national national registers. Uh, Renner said very clearly that uh, this, um, these registers were 
where to be. So everybody could should decide himself or herself to which group he or she would belong. <coughs> and it would it would not necessarily mean that this a person who is uh, in the Czech Katasta would be a Czech, but that he aligns with the Czech national project, or that it's a um, it's a bekenntnis, so um, a confession, but not in a religious thing. But you you confess that I belong to this group, and uh, he actually also provided for um, confessionless people. So. Again, not in the in the religious sense, but in the in the in the ethno-national sense. But he would then say that those people who do not decide to which group they belong, they would go into the group of the majority local population. So if they don't care, then one can assume that these people are fine with the majority. Um, but it's very problematic, and this was actually criticized also by his by many fellow social democrats, in particular Czech social democrats, who said, "No, this is a form that fosters the dominant nations." And uh, and from my point of view, they rightly um, uh, said that uh, Renner was also, besides being a social democrat, he was also a German nationalist, uh, because of course, if if uh, the dominant language is German, then it makes sense for people, uh, for, for personal careers or, or yeah, to, to oh, increase your social status, status to register as a German, because then you would get uh, German education. And this is why, for instance, social democrats, Czech social democrats were not very happy with this idea. Um, they might have th thought that this is a good idea for Czech migrant workers in Vienna, but not for the Bohemian lands. And then they, they, they were... They, it was a huge discussion, and it was a very interesting discussion in the early 20th century. As for the criticism of this idea, um, there's a frequently cited quote by a Latvian politician and philosopher, uh, Max Lasserson from 1922, that the idea of non-territorial national autonomy, despite being widely recognized theoretically, is not acceptable in practice and uh, to those who are not used to it. Why do you think this attractive idea of managing ethnic diversity is so difficult to impl implement? And were there any successful examples of non-territorial autonomy in Europe or perhaps worldwide? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's true that it's, it is complicated, but it's mostly complicated because, because it's, it's counterintuitive for people who have grown up in nation-states thinking. Um, but the basic idea is very logic that um, that uh, ethnic belonging has something to do where you with a group that you feel attached to and groups can be everywhere. Uh, they not. I mean, you can be you can be Jewish uh, uh, in London, you can be Jewish in Glasgow or Boston, and uh, so it, it's not. It, it's not necessarily linked to a territory. Um, um, so I think this is this. The unlogic that the people conceive it as so complicated is because we're not used to think, uh, conceive of of the ethno national groups as as a, as a group and belonging and uh, rather make this connex to the state. Uh, but of course there are problematic things, and we, and we touched upon it uh, right before, is this, um, is the question is who you are and uh, how to register and, uh, um, and whether if you do it only on the absolute free will, um, then you can have, uh, I think political scientists call it today ethno-corruption, so that people uh, assigned with the other group in order to gain resources and uh, or refrain from being part or uh, it will always have the radicals going front. Uh, so this is of course problematic and so and as soon as you include um, correction mechanisms so a board that would decide whether this person is really uh, Czech or German. Uh, 
what they actually did in Moravia uh, for the school boards. So they checked whether a six-year-old girl uh, knows the language, the, the, the tuition language of that school, and it, that's very brutal. Um, so, but if you so in having a correction mechanism is contradicts the idea of individual choice. Um, but if you don't have the correction mechanisms, it is open to to ethnic business yes. to abuse. Yeah, and so um, this is what 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 uh, what needs to be post considered. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much talking about... Uh, I mean, this, we, our project does not have a normative intention, so it's not that we, uh, we say, yes, uh, let's implement this everywhere. Yeah. But I think, it's a, I think when you discuss about uh, minority, uh, minority management, it's good if you have this in mind and uh, thinking as well. Um, but it's a, the, and the other the second part of your question was whether it was implemented. Yes, it was. Um, but it's um, I mentioned already that in, in 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 four Austrian provinces in Moravia, which is today the Czech Republic, in Bukovina, part of today's Romania and Ukraine, um, Bosnia in a slightly different way, and in Galicia in 1914, they had not a fully fledged non-territorial autonomy system, but non-territorial arrangements in the in the voting system. And then the first country that ever uh, fully introduced non-territorial autonomy was uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic in January 1918. Um, so right with the, the, the... when Ukraine declared its independence from 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 Russia, from it wasn't the empire anymore, but it was after the October Revolution, so after the Bolshevik-sized power in, in in Russia, Ukraine went for independence, and in order to to accommodate uh, uh, the, the large national minority groups, they provided for a law on they called it national personal autonomy, and um, it was actually drafted um, by people who had very well read uh, the Austro-Marxists and that were actually also involved in the translation of the of Renner's and Bauer's work into Russian in early in, in still in the in Imperial Russia. Um, and then it is the 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 most well-known or most often cited example are the interwar Baltic states, in particular Estonia, um, where in 1925 they introduced, uh, they called it cultural autonomy law for, for, the, for the countries um, German, Jews, Russians and Swedes. Um, actually only the Germans and the, and the, the Jews implemented it. But, uh, and it, uh, Estonia had a very um, liberal, uh, in both sense, so a very uh, far-reaching minority accommodation policy, but also liberal in the sense of um, that no forced uh, uh, regis uh, registration in national catastrophes could appear. So it was... Uh, it, because they, they were liberal democracies, so this is, uh, they were driven by this. And then... Uh, which is very a very interesting case, but I know very little. But the first constitution of Cyprus after independence in 1960, it was very uh, it was called a bi -com communal state. So with the Greek and the Turkish commune that would elect uh, its its members of parliament separately and would also have their uh, separate councils for cultural affairs, but they would have uh, also separate elections to the to central power. It didn't. Uh, I mean, this, the history of, of Cyprus went a different direction, a totally different direction. Um, and actually, today, uh, after the fall of communism, you find it in 
you find non-territorial autonomy legislations uh, in, my, in quite a couple of Central and Eastern European uh, countries, uh, most well known maybe in Hungary. Um, but this would be then rather the political scientists to study. Um, and we have national minority councils for the Sami in Norway, um, although there are also discussions whether uh, uh, indigenous and for, for, for Maori and in New Zealand and, and also in some respects for the First Nations in Canada. But there it, it, it intermingles with the question, you know, indigenous uh, groups are, uh, they might live very dispersed, but they have a strong attachment to territory. And there are discussions, uh, in particular among Sami, whether uh, non-territorial autonomy is actually the right tool to accommodate um, their national needs. But that's a, that's a very contemporary, um, and it's interesting that uh, most people. I'm I'm also in such in a in a in a network, uh, a European non-territorial autonomy network. Uh, it's a cost action, and most people who are interested in this topic today rather come from the political sciences or from legal studies. Um, so there is. I mean, there are historians who are studying this topic, but it's um, it's more. It, it has drawn, it has been paid more attention as a practice. As a practice, and very often these uh, these scholars are very normative and uh, uh, strongly support this idea. And uh, as I said before, our project has not this normative attention, but I, I clearly see that, uh, of course. We speak to, to current discussions, to today's discussions, and I think it is what we can say of the past is, is, could be very interesting for, for the contemporary as well. Um, thank you. And finally, where can people go to learn more about this fascinating topic? Um, well, I mentioned already this, uh, this cost action, this, this uh, European non-territorial autonomy network. So if you're more interested in this political uh, science uh, approach, or you can uh, come to, you can check out our, our website of our Vienna University-based project at the Institute of European, East European History. We have a website where you can see uh, our current publications and what we are doing. And um, if you're really interested, you can you can join us as a visiting scholar, bring your own money, and um, do research with us. Uh, that's we have very lively discussions. Um, yeah, that's uh, so we we you can learn more with us. So come and uh, study it. Oh, actually, I forgot. I, maybe that's now a little already off the topic, but you can cut it. Uh, there's a very lively discussion in Israel-Palestine on non-territorial autonomy. Because, the, I mean, obviously the two-state solution is that for already for a couple of years. And uh, so how to, how to accommodate, the, the, and the diversity will not disappear, so uh, how to, what to do. And um, I would not say that this is the... the, the the most dominant discussion there, but um, uh, one of the options discussed. One of the options discussed, and you find a lot on conferences on non-territorial autonomy. You always find scholars from Israel, Palestine, who uh, yeah, who discuss this this option. Uh, and actually, it's not by chance because already in history, the um, a Zionist group in in Prague in in in, in the Habsburg Empire was discussing this idea for Palestine uh, when, when there was still no, no talk about uh, independence of Israel, so the, the idea of a binational state. Um, and they, of course, they knew what was going on in Moravia and they were, knew what was going on in, in discussions about Karl Renner and the Austro-Marxists. Um, 
and one of the kind of the most uh, the biggest recipients of the idea in the Russian Empire were also Jewish uh, co- like intellectuals and Jewish, Jewish intellectuals. Power, uh, yeah. party, so yeah, indeed not an, not accidentally. Yeah, and those who implemented it uh, in in the Ukrainian People's Republic, the person who drafted it was the Minister for Jewish Affairs, and he happens to be a Jewish social Jewish socialist socialist um, who who was very well aware of was what was going on in the Habsburg Empire. But they didn't copy it, so it's, uh, you have to be careful. So what the, there is also, in Russia, there's also, in Imperial Russia, there's also a long, decades-long discussion on federalism and decentralization. And uh, upon this discussion, then non-territorial autonomy comes in. So it's not that, the, that it's not a transfer from oh, the Austrian unit and the Russian took it. It's, um, it is because there was a discussion in Russia, they could translate uh, what was going on in, in, the, in Imperial Austria. So it, it was all, the, the origins of non-territorial autonomy are also to be found in Russia. Um, thank you. Thank you, Boris, very much for your time and for this fascinating discussion. And we are all looking forward to your future publications and research on this topic. Thank you so much.